um, that sort of leads us a little bit into today's uh, today's word. I just wanted to um, I think I was just contemplating this week. I wanted to lead into some some thoughts just on the various attributes of our Father God, uh, where we have uh, we know the different words that we have: Jehovah Rapha, you know, the Lord our physician, and Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. Jehovah said, "Can you the the, the uh, Lord our righteousness?" And those are just a few of the the many attributes of the Father. But what um, what they all suggest is that there's this uh, incredible God uh, who has created this this tiny little blue planet and this incredible immense universe. Um, Matthew and I were just camping up uh, last weekend. We were up at the uh, the north end of of Cape Breton, and we. We had a campsite that was just out, right out on the open ocean. I mean, we weren't specifically, we were, we were across the, the little roadway from the open ocean, but, but anyway, it was close enough. And when you look up and you see the immensity of the, the, the heavens, and you start to really comprehend uh, how much space is actually out there in space, and that the Father would give us this tiny little blue planet for us to live and to thrive and seek to have a relationship with each one of us is, is really quite a humbling um, situation. And what I wanted to look at today was the, the, the idea of appropriation on God's plan and God's will and God's ideas for us. We know beyond the shadow of a doubt that our Father loves us. And it's, a, it's quite a remarkable experience being a father myself and watching your child grow and, and watching my son yesterday. He was giving a talk at the Parent Fast in Fresno. But the, 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 the understanding and the knowledge that I have of my son is really quite a remarkable thing. Because really, when he was this big, I can remember looking at him being this big and being scared to death of this tiny little bundle. Um, but as you sort of grow with them and, and live and, and on all of that sort of thing, I think your, your children teach you as much about yourself, I, I think, as, as you teach them. I mean, it's really quite a, quite a reciprocal relationship that you have with your children. But the very fact of the matter is that we know our children, we know their patterns better than we know anybody else just simply because we have been there since their very first breath and we have a very intimate knowledge of who they are and we start to see their patterns through life <clears throat> you know you you watch them grow and you i won't won't shed light on any of matthews in particular but the the, the very fact of the matter is that that intimate knowledge of, of our children is how the father looks at us and the, the intimacy of that relationship cannot be understated. It, uh, he knows the very um, number of the hairs on our head. He knows our genetic makeup. He knows everything about our thought processes, how we apply thought to, to everything. He knows what we require. He knows what we've, what we've done. And it's a, it's a, a very um, intimate relationship that we have with him. And, and some of those things I'd like to sort of bring out a little bit today um, when we're dealing with the various attributes of God. But, but I just wanted to start off with a few definitions just about uh, appropriation. Appropriation is a very important part about our walk in the Lord because the Lord has given us authority through the receiving of the Holy Spirit because Jesus shed forth the Holy Spirit, because Jesus became our Lord and Savior at a moment in time when we were still enemies of God. And, and it's, a, it's a very, very direct thing that he's done for us. He has given us authority through the receiving of the Holy Spirit to call ourselves after his son's name and to appropriate, to take to ourselves the, the, the meaning of all that implies. We now become the children of God. Jesus was the only begotten of the Father, we read in the Bible. He was the only begotten Son of the Father God when, when he was born. And we know about the whole story of, the, of, of Jesus' birth 
and then we, we start to read a little bit about his life, and then we also read about his death, but most importantly, we read about his resurrection, because all of the things that he spoke of about the Father were true, because he did raise, rise from the dead on the third day, and that's really what he said he would do. He did shed forth the Holy Ghost, and on the day of Pentecost, uh, 2,000 years ago or thereabouts, uh, people received that the gift of the Holy Spirit. And since then, that, that has been going on. And we have the, uh, the absolute knowledge of the truth of these matters through experience. And just like we are earthly fathers to our children, our father is that to us. He gives us knowledge of himself, and he helps us to govern our life in a way that means we get to spend eternity and our, our forever life with him. Because we have the natural man that will die, but we have the spiritual man that will live on. And this is really the sort of the most important part to dwell on with uh, the Lord our righteousness and the Lord our provider. Merriam-Webster defines appropriation. Merriam-Webster definition is to take exclusive possession, to set apart for a particular use. And there's also, as in the, the case of a government, <laughs> to take or use without right or authority. Now, it's a very interesting thing about that right and authority because Jesus uh, through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven, Jesus, through those, those actions, and when he shed forth the Holy Spirit and sealed us with that Holy Spirit of promise, he now gave us the right to take what was not ours. It wasn't ours to take until he sealed us with that Holy Ghost and that Spirit of promise. Now, the Cambridge Dictionary definition, and I like this one, is the act of taking something, such as an idea, a customer style, and using it for yourself. And that's what we do with the grace of God. We take to ourselves. It's literally, the Lord says, you reach out and you take it to yourself, and it will become yours. And uh, it's, a, it's a very important part of what we do, because we capitalize on the strength and the power that God has shed forth through the Holy Ghost. We are led by the Holy Ghost, we are filled with the Holy Ghost, and we have the power of the Holy Ghost in us. And that is what appropriation is. We now use that knowledge and that power and that wisdom, and we use it to govern our, our walk in our, in our life. We use the sword, as it were, of the Spirit, the Word of God, to give us the knowledge. And it's the direct knowledge. It's a, it's a very interesting thing, because we often talk about the, the, uh, the, the dunamis that we receive, that miracle-working power, but it's inherent. We inherit from God His miracle-working power, and we shed it forth. We project it and we transmit what we've received from him. And it's, a, it's, it's a, an encompassing idea. I wanted to start reading in John chapter 6. Most of us know this story. There's been a lot of talks on this one. I woke up with a very dry mouth and dry throat this morning, so I'm, I'm hoping that I'm not sort of spitting foam as I talk. It's one of those things. That's a good image for you, folks, just in case. You can't see it on camera, right? just, just in case. So if you see anything flying, it's because of that. It's not in sense. All right, John, chapter 6 and verse 1. Now, this is, uh, this is a very um, important telling of, uh, of one of the accounts that Jesus had. It's, it's fairly early on in the piece. And after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed after him, because they saw the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus, 
went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When, uh, and when uh, Jesus then lifted up his eyes, and he saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And he said this to prove him, for he knew what he would do. I'm going to stop and dwell on that moment right there. Because this is a really important part of our relationship with God. The questions that he asks us. Where are we going to get some bread today, Philip? And you can apply this question to any situation. And it's sort of, um, it's an interesting thing, because as we walk through the Lord, and we walk on in the Lord, and we, we grow in knowledge of him, our faith gets exercised over time. Little tiny things, those faith-building moments that add up to the strength to handle when something big comes, to test our faith. And when, we're, when our faith is tested, those hundreds of tiny little things that happen in, uh, in our life that, that come to that moment. Where are we going to buy bread for 5000 today, Philip? That's a big question. We don't know, Lord. I don't know where we're going to buy 5000 uh, bread for 5000 It's a lot of people. But it's a very interesting thing. One little anecdote. I'm sort of I'm sort of developing the, the the love for little anecdotes from the past, and we're talking about faith building exercises. We all know them in our testimony. Our testimonies are riddled with literally hundreds, if not thousands, of those little moments in time where the Lord has proved Himself to be that that uh, all He promises us to or promises us to be. It was very early in my walk, and I've probably given this testimony here, but I haven't. It used to be part of my daily testimony back in the day. But when I first came to the Lord, um, 1986, um, there was a bunch of us living in this house, and um, the landlord was getting a little bit upset because there were so many of us living in, in this rented house. And he asked us, you know, <laughs> except for the two tenants with their, their names on the, uh, on the lease, he asked the rest of us to kindly leave by this date. And so I had to pray to get a job because when I received the Holy Spirit, I was down to my last 27 cents in my pocket. It was a very interesting experience to be in a, a place where you don't really know and uh, with a bunch of people that you've just met and you have literally 27 cents to your name. So um, what I ended up doing was um, one of the brothers was a, was a barber and he cut my hair and he cut all my... I used to have shoulder length hair, and he cut all that hair off. And um, I went and got a job. I, I did an interview. It was at McDonald's. You know, McDonald's was the only job at that moment I could land. And let me tell you, it was actually a little bit beyond my ability. It was beyond the scope of my ability at that point. As I think I've mentioned in a couple of the other testimonies, you know, I sounded like Keanu Reeves, Reeves in the day, but I was nowhere near as cool. Because the... The, the, the very fact of all of the things that I had done to that point, I really didn't have a lot of active brain cells that would propel me forward to success in this world. <laughs> so the, the, the job I got at McDonald's, um, one of the brothers would drive me to work, and eventually they, he loaned me a mountain bike, and I used to ride his mountain bike up to McDonald's, and I got a, a little bit of money, and one of the other brothers, the same fellow that cut my hair, loaned me just a little bit of money. Um, and I didn't have a lot of that. It was about $50. It was sort of what they called walking around money. And after buying a few clothes and buying a few things that made me presentable to go to job interviews and all of that, I didn't have a lot of money. One of the brothers loaned me a pair of shoes, and they were tan shoes. They weren't very attractive. Um, that's why he loaned them to but the, the, the fact of the matter was, when I went into my job at McDonald's, I got the job, because pretty much if you, if you had a, a temperature and you were upright, you could get a job at McDonald's. And, and the, the, uh, the idea was that I, 
I went in and I, I got my uniform. Those were back in the days of the little paper hats and, and, and all of that. You had to wear the, 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 the attractive uh, nylon uniform. Fortunately, ours were not the brown ones. They were the, the blue ones. And they, so I got my uniform and got all of that. Now you had to have a pair of black shoes to go along with it. Okay, so I didn't have a lot of money and shoes were quite expensive. Shoes in the 1980s were actually <coughs> pricier than they are now, if you could believe it. Like I can remember easily paying $100 for a pair of shoes back then. And, and that was like a pair of Nikes or Reeboks or whatever. And I think I can buy them cheaper now at Walmart. But the, the, the very fact of the matter was that I just simply didn't have enough money to buy a pair of black shoes. So I wore the tan ones. And uh, it was, a, it was a sort of one of those things. And you're sort of going through your day and, and the manager comes in and there's several people not wearing black shoes with their uniforms. Now, this was back in the days when bosses could yell at their employees without any form of, of, uh, of uh, you know, no, nobody would come back. What was the word? Repercussions. Repercussions. That's it. Rosalie shouting across the room. So we had that moment where he's going through and inspecting everybody's shoes. And he, I'm literally standing at the, the quarter in DLT grill. That was my grill. And I'm standing there with my little paper hat on, just praying, Lord, just let him not see my shoes. And he yelling at that girl, yelling at that guy, and yelled at the guy on the other side of me and he kept on going. And he didn't yell at me. But I got the message very clear that I needed a pair of black shoes. So I had $7 left of the, of the 50 and I, I prayed about it, prayed about it with a brother. I went downtown, and it just so happens, the Salvation Army, I think you have them down in the States, the Salvation Army has little thrift shops, and they, there, in the window, no tax today sale, pair of shoes, $7. And it's, a, it's one of those little moments now, those shoes, I have no long idea how long they've been there, whether they were there all week. But the fundamental part of the fact was we went down on that day with $7 in my pocket, having just prayed to the Lord, Lord, I have only got $7, and Lord, I need a pair of shoes. And this is an important thing because it has to do with your livelihood. You could get written up. You got three, rep three reprimands. You were fired. That was the day. And uh, not wearing the appropriate shoes with your dress uniform or your, your uniform was enough to get you written up. So it was, a, it was for me, it, it seems like a very small and significant thing all of these years later. And I'm sort of telling you this story and maybe people's eyes are rolling. But the very fact of the matter is, these are the moments, those are the big questions that, that build our faith. And we come to the place where our faith is tempted, and our faith being tempted, we understand when our faith is tested because of the hundreds of little miracles that the Lord has done, that he's going to honor his word at the end. And this is really what these things do for us. Now, shoes at McDonald's don't have an old, whole lot to do with the, the, the feeding of the 5,000. Where do we buy bread today? But what it does is it gives us an indication, just as I was explaining, the Father knows our patterns, how we apply things, and these are the faith-building moments. Now, we'll just continue reading. In verse 7, Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. And, verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother, said unto him, There, a lad here, which had five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? In verse 10, and Jesus said, Make the men sit down. And there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Now, I want to draw your attention to what they've got to work with. They've got two small fishes, same small fishes. I don't know what small fishes are. 
in Nova Scotia here, you know, a big fish is a really big fish. So, so it could mean this and it could mean this. We don't know what two small fishes are, but, but fundamentally there's not a lot of food. The five lobes would be a little flat breads. I mean, they're pitas. They're not very big. And um, sort of looking at this naturally, you're thinking about this is an impossible situation that there can be no physical answer to because literally everybody will get it from the food. Here we go. Verse 11, Jesus took the loaves. And when he had given things, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down and likewise of the fishes, inasmuch as they would. And when they were filled, and his disciples said, gather up the fragments that remain, and not that nothing be lost. And therefore they gathered them together, and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above uh, unto them that had eaten. Twelve baskets out of two things that I could probably hold in my hand. Now, I had one sister tell me one time when I was trying to explain to her God's provision, and she said, numbers don't lie. She worked at a bank. She said, numbers don't lie. But what she really didn't have was an understanding or a vision of the way God works. Because God doesn't work within the confines of natural law. He doesn't work in the confines of the decimal system. He works his power, the way he works, just as he created, as I mentioned, this little blue globe in the center of the universe for us to inhabit, to have a relationship with each one of us. It's really quite a remarkable miracle. And no matter where we go, there God is. And no matter where we go and where we are, there he is. And it doesn't matter if we're preaching the gospel or if we're sitting down and having dinner. It, it doesn't matter if we're at our jobs and we're being persecuted. It doesn't matter what we're doing in the course of the day. God is there with us. And uh, he has that idea of provision for us. I think that was in the gifts this morning. Verse 14. Now those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that, that prophet that should come into the world. And when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And this is a key point because they were looking for, they were looking for not just a, a, a savior and a redeemer for their souls. They were looking for a physical king that would restore the kingdom again to Israel. And we like to project on God what we want from him. We love to do that. But the fact of the matter is, he <coughs> projects on us what his will is for us. And that's the important thing to dwell on. The important part to dwell on in this whole account is that God knows us, and he loves us, and he wants to provide for us. But he's also going through that building our faith, and giving us an ability to see him working behind the scenes so that when we come against that big, difficult situation, that we don't have to worry. Because it's the same as, the, as this, this little thing. The sister said, numbers don't lie. But yet, they gathered up 12 baskets from, from two little bits of food. And it was an impossibility, but it happened. And that's who our Father is. That's who Jesus is. Our Lord and our Savior, who will eventually return as our King, but at that moment, that wasn't his place. So instead of taking this, this grandiose bow and, and being uh, going in, as most men would, uh, going into town, uh, being, being heralded as the King of Kings, he decided to, to go off by himself and to, to pray. And the... But the biggest part, I think, that we can take away from um, how the miracle went, and the vast majority of the miracle was the fact that God was there with them. And in verse 11, when Jesus gave thanks, that's what he said. Thank you, Father. And that was, uh, that was the, the cure for care. 
How are we going to feed all of these people, Jesus? That's what's on the disciples' minds. How can we possibly do this? And they're getting worried about the, 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 the physical logistics of it. But in the end, it was, thank you, Father, and yet it was done. Verse 16. And when uh, even was come, now his disciples went in, down into the sea and entered into a ship and went over the, uh, the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come down to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew, so that when they rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh into the ship, and they were afraid. But he said unto them, It is I, be not afraid. And they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land, whither they came. Now I just wanted to read verse 21 from the Amplified, because it was a, uh, I read this whole, the, the whole talk from the Amplified last night, and it was uh, verse 21 in the Amplified, says, then they were quite willing and glad for him to come into the boat, now that the boat was once at land and they, that they steered for, and immediately they reached the shore toward which they had been slowly making. And I guess the point I wanted to make out of that was the fact that they're in very shallow water. I think it's only about 40 meters deep. And when the winds come up on a 40-meter lake, we, uh, we live down Lake Erie. And uh, when the winds would come up on Lake Erie, a small wind would create a really large chop in the water. The, the waves could be four and six feet out of nowhere. And uh, a lot of people actually perished in their little fishing boats because they would be way out. It's a beautiful day. And out of nowhere, the wind would come up and they would end up in these huge swells and chops and get swamped. So this is what the disciples were experiencing at that moment when Jesus came to them walking on the water. So first of all, Jesus is walking on the swells, and he's walking on the chop. And there they are in their tiny little boat, and they're struggling to get to shore. And this is something that we can all identify with. It's something that we can, we can sort of look and see with every situation that we're up against, a difficult one, that we're struggling. And the Lord comes to us and, and speaks to us and tells us what to do. And immediately, they're at land. And the, the miracle of, the, of that is, once again, we're talking about those faith-building moments in our walk. Now, the day following, in verse 22, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none but uh, the other boat there, save one, whereunto his disciples were entered in, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, uh, but that they, his disciples were gone away alone. So they were looking for him. They were looking for this guy they wanted to anoint as their king. And uh, they knew the disciples left, and they saw them leave, and they knew Jesus was still here, and they could still look across the lake, because it's a small, small sea, and they could see on the other side that there was just one boat there. In verse 23, Howbeit, there came other boats from t the Tiberias nigh into the place uh, where they did eat bread, and after the Lord had given thanks. And when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, uh, they took uh, shipping and came to Capernaum to seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, of the sea, uh, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? And Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. You're coming here for natural sustenance. You're coming here because I provided for you something that was natural, but you're forgetting that this whole thing was done for a reason. So look up. That was the idea. And this is what we struggle with with people when they're so fixated on the natural here and now. We talk about that a lot with the, uh, the, um, the prosperity doctrine in the gospel, the, the, the idea that that becoming, coming to the Lord, you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise, and you'll never have any problems, which is a, a, a far cry from what the Bible actually tells us, that the 
the idea is that we're looking at the salvation of our souls. We're looking for our faith to be built up and to go to a place where we really know and understand that the Father is there with us and that we will spend eternity with him. And that's where they were missing it because they're looking at the natural situation. They're looking at him as somebody that would be a good politician and a good king to kick the Romans out of Jerusalem. And he says, you're missing the point. In verse 27, he says, labor not for that meat which perisheth, but that uh, for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. And that's where he became, the Christ. He was the Christ. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was upon him. As we saw in, in, uh, in uh, Jew, um, the, with the story of John, when John baptized him, he saw the Spirit of God descending upon him, and it abode upon him, and the voice from heaven. Jesus became the Christ. Then they said unto him, What shall we do that we uh, might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. And they said unto him, What sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe thee? What doest thou work? And then he goes on to talk about the manna in heaven, calls himself the bread of life. And he gets into a little bit of a, of a controversial discussion with the Jews. And let's, let's just skip down to verse 47, uh, 47 of that same chapter. I'm going to shorten this up just a little bit. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. He says, I am the bread of life. He went into the discussion about the bread. He said, your fathers did eat the manna in the wilderness and are dead. But this is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. Herein is the greatest miracle of all. We, read, we sing that in the song. That the salvation of our souls is the key purpose to why we come today. We seek out all of those attributes of God. We seek out Jehovah Rapha, God, the, God our, the Lord, our physician. We seek out Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our, our Je, sorry, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider, and Jehovah uh, Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. But above all things, the Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness, is the key. Because he says, the salvation of your souls is paramount, despite the fact that I can feed 5,000 men with a couple of loaves and a couple of fishes. He says, that's not the important thing to dwell on. He says, the miraculous is all around you, and the miracles I do, they're of the Father, which the Father has given unto me, because he has given me the power to do so. I speak of my Father, and my words are true, Jesus said. The the important part is the salvation of your souls. And as we're, we're getting to that place where we stopped and we started, and we, we talked about the relationship that we have with him, how much he knows us, how much he loves us, about how he created that little blue marble, about how all of these things, all working together for that incredible point. Now, I'll read verse 48 again. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. But this is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. And if any man shall eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Then the Jews strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man eat of the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, he shall have no life in you. And we're about to take that communion 
we're about to take of uh, uh, partake of that communion in a very short period of time where we do honor the flesh that he gave and the body that he gave and we have life in us and we can testify of the knowledge of Christ firsthand of the experience of receiving of the Holy Ghost and power of of the experience that God came unto us and gave us a new existence that he gave us all of his his love and his attributes and he came unto us and he gave us a newfound existence we no longer live in a place where we are lost how many are our sister and brother's testimonies recently from from uh, Pennsylvania were very telling things because they were so young in the Lord and their testimonies have changed a little bit but they really haven't changed that much now 20 years later we we look back and we can understand and see that the Lord called us and that nothing has really changed in that relationship. And that's an important thing. Because the salvation of our soul is paramount. That's what he came for. The ages of the ages we will live with God. When we speak about, I, that used to be preached through chapter 22 of the book of Revelation, it's God's unfinished symphony, because we come to the end, and the end is just the beginning. And it's fantastic stuff to look at and to read when we read that, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and God shall be with them, and we shall be his people, and God shall wipe away our tears from our eyes, and, and there shall be no more sorrow nor crying, and uh, God shall be them, be with them and be their God. And the former things are passed away. Behold, I make all things new. And we sit there, and we behold the new kingdom, because Christ has reigned until all enemies are under his footstool and, and uh, under his feet. It's, it's a remarkable time because we come to the end of our known Bible, and yet that's just the beginning of what the concept is. It's the most fantastic thing to stop and to dwell on, to literally know that that is the beginning of all things. This is still life in the womb. We have no idea what God has prepared for us. Uh, the, the Bible says, God, I have not seen nor ear heard those things which God has prepared for those that love him. And that is his love for us. And that is the projected idea of his love for us. And he's given it to us through demonstration of power and faith in our life, in our walk. And it's a constant building of ideas and knowledge and power in our life to yield over all circumstance that comes against us. It's fantastic stuff. Got where I was. Sorry. All right. Did we get to verse fifty-three yet? We got to verse fifty-three. Let's let's read verse fifty-three from the Amplified. My apologies to poor Fidel. He's trying to interpret the words. I, I do apologize. Thanks, brother, for that. Thanks, Julie, for what she does. Verse fifty-three from the Amplified. Jesus said to them, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, you cannot have any life in yourselves unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. We were dead in our trespass and sin. Jesus came to us, and unless, it says, unless you, <coughs> unless you appropriate his life and the saving merit of his blood, Unless we reach out and take to ourselves and appropriate through the power he's given us, we have no life. So it's something that he's, he's shed forth and given us. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll be closing in 2 Corinthians here. Second Corinthians chapter five and verse seventeen to start. Therefore, 
If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We're going to sing that song at the end of, uh, at the, end of the, 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 the last dispensation with the Lord. And we'll be singing there in the kingdom of God with him that very verse. But what he's telling us as a precursor, he gives us a new life. He gives us a new shot, a new identity. He gives us uh, a, an ability to be his son, his daughter, rather than being somebody who is just living some life in the world and not having any meaningful existence. And all things are of God, in verse 18 who hath reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. And we talked about that. But we are now, as Jesus was, we walk as the sons and daughters of the living God on the planet. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their, rest, their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now we are ambassadors for Christ, as though uh, as uh, though God did beseech you by us. We pray you, in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be the righteousness of God in him. And that is really it. That is the biggest miracle of all. Because he gave us this ability now through the blood of Christ. We're going to stop in, in a couple of minutes and we're going to, we're going to take our communion service and we're going to remember the sacrifice that Jesus did for each one of us we're personally going to take that cup and drink, or eat, drink it. We're going to eat that bread and we're going to think on it. And we're going to remember what God did for us through Christ. And we're going to really understand what that verse means. Because he reconciled us unto himself through that incredible sacrifice that Jesus did for each one of us. And that is what this is about. It's not about the feeding of the 5,000, because the miraculous is there every day. It's about the salvation of our souls. It's about why he did it. It's not even about what the what he did in, in, in particular. We can all testify the $7 shoe story and, and all of those things that happened in our life, all of those little things that, that, that have built our faith through time as we require. Uh, but the, the greatest miracle of all, folks, is really... We go back to chapter 22 of the book of Revelation. When we're standing shoulder to shoulder, praising God and singing that song, that will be the day that will be, um, we, can, we can say, was the day that Jesus, that was what he died, what he died for. It'll be that moment that the tabernacle of God is now with men and that there's no more sorrow, that there's no more pain, there is no more death, no more crying, no more misery. Those are the things. And that's what we look for. So.